Thank you very much, Professor Michael Levitt, for coming onto this um, program uh, for Vitalstoff Block. Um, this is a German site. We're going to um, do this interview in English, but it is intended uh, for the German audience um, also, or primarily I will translate the content afterwards because it is a very important topic we're going to discuss. Um, Michael, you have been um, very actively following the um, development of the current corona crisis right from or very early on from its beginning and um, this is uh, the reason why I have been uh, requesting the pleasure and the honor of, of this interview because I think you have an important message um, for, for our audience to share. Maybe we could start, um, if you were so kind, to give a little bit of your personal uh, background um, um, to, to, to begin with. So currently I am a professor of structural biology at Stanford Medical School in California. Um, I actually was educated in South Africa and then in England. Um, I've had academic positions in Cambridge, England, at the Weizmann Institute in Israel and at Stanford. Uh, I feel very much like I'm a, a globalist. I actually speak some German and I'm very tempted to say a few words, but I won't. Um, so, you know, I, for me, this has been a, because in some ways, whether we like it or not, this is a global problem that we all face. Um, so uh, my degree, my best degree was in physics, but then I went to Cambridge and did a PhD in computational structural biology, a field that I'm still in. And uh, I'm actually still quite active at writing computer programs and having somebody who likes to get their hands dirty. Right. Um, so um, is, is it fair to say then for the, for the general audience that, that you are very experienced in and dealing with numbers, with, with statistics, with uh, development and interpretation yeah. of, of data? Data analysis of all kinds, but it's also something that I, I actually enjoy doing very much. I think that uh, in some ways I've been saying that the, I'm not telling the story, I don't have a message, I'm just helping the numbers. I'm almost like a voice for the numbers. I look at the numbers and try to report what the numbers are saying. And uh, in, in, in a strange way, I think the numbers in this whole pandemic have had a lot to say. So in some ways it's sort of easy for me because they have a lot to say and all I have to do is help say it. Right, and uh, the reason why you looked into this is also because you have some connections, some, some, uh, com some connections to China. Is that, is that true? Did I get this right? Yes, as I said, I'm, I'm a very broad person, very broad worldview. Um, my wife is a curator of Chinese contemporary photography. So uh, she likes, she spends time in China. Obviously I spend time with her in China. But China is also very interested in um, bringing its uh, basic sciences uh, up to a Western level. So in many, many ways, all the Americans came to Europe to learn. And uh, that probably continued until the Second World War, and then many people from Europe now go to the United States to learn. Many Chinese came to the United States to learn. So science is a very international subject, and uh, we spend part of the year uh, living in China. Right. So for this reason, uh, it, it, it was um, a matter of both per personal and professional interest uh, for you to look into how this um, epidemic developed, which was reported early at the beginning of, of this year in, in um, at least in, in, in the Western world. Maybe it wasn't, it was um, reported earlier in, in, in China, but this is so both professional and, and personal interest. And what did you find? So, uh, so I should also say that I really got involved more from a personal point of view. Um, I didn't expect to be using my analysis. I've now been involved for a hundred days this is not something I expected. Uh, I really started out, uh, my wife and I had let people in China know that we were aware of the epidemic, that we were worried for them. Uh, 
part of the worry was to then compare the starting uh, COVID epidemic with SARS. And very quickly, I saw that COVID is growing, or at least at that time, was growing much more quickly than SARS. But also, it had a very different profile. SARS had a very, very high uh, lethality. Where SARS killed people in China, in Hong Kong, and in Canada, three different countries, at rates of about 15%. Um, so I was that, sorry, please say this again. There, there was a there was a glitch in, in, in the line. You, SARS had, that, with SARS, the the fatality rate is quoted as ten percent. That's the average. But for example, in Hong Kong, it was seventeen percent. In China, in Canada, it was fifteen percent. In China, it was ten percent. So it looked like it had a high rate everywhere, and that was obviously a concern. But then SARS. Uh, reached uh, in about three months, went from nothing to 8,000 cases with 800 deaths, and then just stopped. And it was very clear, even in the last week of January, that the rate at which cases were increasing for coronavirus would be much, much faster than, than SARS. So obviously, a very important thing to worry about was what, what is the case fatality? How, how dangerous a disease is this? Now, I remember, we have friends all over China. And so looking at this, at, in China, so initially all the data was reported by the Chinese websites. Later on, I used the World Health Organization, and I must say all the data has been consistent. But in China, they had data for the province of Hubei, which is the province where Wuhan is, and that's where most of the uh, cases were. But there were also about one third of the cases outside Hubei, so they were in parts of China that weren't Hubei. And in that, in that area, I looked at it, it was 15 times lower. So at that time, fatality uh, inside Hubei was 2 or 3%, but outside Hubei was 0 0.1, 0 0.2%. So I immediately felt that I had some good news, at least for my friends in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Guangzhou, that the fatality seems to be high in, in Wuhan, but exactly the same disease seems to have a much lower fatality elsewhere. So for this reason, I decided at that point to separate China, not Hubei, from China, Hubei. So because it, the, and, and looking at these things separately ended up being very important. In fact, my wife was joking, saying, I've created a new province in China called not Hubei. Um, but in fact, uh, even so today, there are differences. Because in some ways, in Wuhan, uh, the authorities were really uh, caught off guard. Uh, whereas in the rest of the China, they knew that the people coming from Wuhan would be carriers. So they could focus on those people. And so we have these two contrasting uh, events. So it was interesting to follow them. Um, what happened was that I was interested in this for this reason. Uh, we had written a, a New Year's greeting. Chinese New Year was I think the 24th or 25th of December of January, um, we wrote them uh, a New Year's greeting. They were very happy to hear people from the West sharing, cons being consoling about this oncoming problem. And then a few days later, I also sent Liz a few graphs, a map of Wuhan just showing where the outbreaks were. And I sent this uh, essentially by private WhatsApp, the Chinese WeChat, which is essentially the same as, as WhatsApp or Facebook. And to my surprise, we actually got onto an airplane on the evening of the 2nd of February. I arrived in New York the next day and found all these emails saying, was I the Michael Levitt who had written this report? It had been leaked by somebody. It wasn't secret, but somebody had given it to the Chinese media. They had translated it and put it on the web. And of course, I said, it is me. My email is very easily accessible. I don't ever hide my email. It's, if you Google Michael Levitt Stanford, you find my eagle email. So basically, I was, but the point was is that in, in this report, what I'd looked at, and this ends up being something that people are still looking at all the time, is just taking either the cases or the deaths and looking at the total number today and dividing the total number today by the total number yesterday. Uh, we had numbers early on for cases and for deaths. We probably had 4,000 cases by that time and I think 100 or 200 deaths. And when I looked at the numbers, the numbers for cases were all over the place. And I very quickly realized something that's now completely accepted, that cases depend on how you test. And inside Wuhan, 
cases were problematic because things were really chaotic. They didn't have time to test people who weren't, weren't really, really sick. Whereas deaths are much more certain. And uh, death today, it's probably the exact same criterion as yesterday. So if you just take the number of deaths yesterday, let's say yesterday there were 50 deaths, total deaths. And today that total has increased from 50 to 70. That would mean that if you divide 70 by 50, you get 1.4, which means that there's a 40% increase in number of deaths. Now, it's important because when the number today equals the number yesterday, things have stopped changing. So when today is the same as yesterday, or the ratio is one, and then the number started out above one, initially it was two, even three. And I think this number is in some way related to the uh, R value that epidemiologists use, although I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about R effective and R zero. I'm not gonna get into that now. Um, but basically this ratio, when I looked at it on the 2nd of February, had been decreasing linearly for the four previous days. It had been on the 28th of January, uh, 1.3, and then 1.25, and then 1.22, and then 1.18. So I said to my friends, look, there's a trend here. This is going to be ending quite soon. Um, I just drew a straight line and said, when does it hit one, which is very naive. But this got leaked, and suddenly I felt that I, have, I, I can't just leave it now. Having said something like this, I need to follow through. So basically then every single day I looked at the numbers. We were on vacation in New York and it wasn't much of a vacation, um, but basically saw how this number was decreasing steadily. Uh, what basically happens in these epidemics is that the number of new cases, I was pre previously I was talking about total cases, total cases today divided by total cases yesterday. And there's always more total cases today because the cases are always growing. But the number of new cases starts off very small and then gets to a maximum and starts to come down again. And this is a very key, a very key uh, landmark or milestone because if you have a very simple symmetrical epidemic, once the number of cases gets to a maximum and starts going down, it basically says you're halfway through. So this I saw in China, I think the cases reached their maxima in the second week of February. I was then able to do some curve fitting and get quite good estimates for the total number of deaths that there would be in Wuhan around, in, sorry, in Hubei, around 3,000, and out of Hubei, about 100. So basically this made me realize, and then I studied some more things. I studied how numbers of deaths relate to number of cases, because every case, or some tiny fraction of the cases become deaths. How long does that take? And we found that in China, it took typically nine days. Um, I haven't seen this mentioned anywhere else, and I don't, it's not a medical observation, but just when there was a big peak in deaths, and nine days later you would see, sorry, forgive me, when there was a big peak in cases, and nine days later you would see a big peak in deaths. And this is actually true in other places, and I've looked at all the numbers. Anyway, so that basically brought me to the beginning of March, uh, and at that time, uh, it was clear that China was going to be fine. I actually wrote a total of 23 reports on China, which are available on the internet. Um, my Stanford website is easy to find, and there, there are links to all these documents. Um, and then, uh, beginning of March, I suddenly realized it's time to look around, because by that time, South Korea uh, was dealing with its epidemic, Iran and Italy also had epidemics. So the important thing was to look at these, and very, very early on, I noticed that although the, I mean, lockdown in China is very, very good. The Chinese have many, many measures for dealing with epidemics like this uh, because of their trauma from SARS. At every airport, at every train station, they measure your temperature. Many stores have temperature monitors, the camera is looking at you. Uh, in China, people wear masks when they have a common cold. It's common courtesy. And they're not wearing masks to protect themselves, they're wearing masks to protect everyone else. And then in China, most payment is done by electronically using your phone. So you, I, I could send you, you know, if you held your phone up now, I could send you money and it wouldn't require any touching or anything like that. You, you display a unique code, I photograph your unique code and I can then send you things. So all of these things made it easier to control things in China. But then I looked at the epidemics in Iran and in Italy, which looked much less well controlled, but 
was very similar. So basically, we now, by the beginning of March, had two epidemics in China, one in Korea, and then Iran and Italy. Seeing that they were all related made me write my much bigger report of 19 pages on the 14th of March, which I released. And there I really felt that the epidemics had something in common and there was something intrinsically slowing down the growth right from the beginning. That's the end of the first phase. Right. Um, so if I understood you correctly, you said um, the epidemic in Iran and Italy were uh, somewhat similar, although both countries have um, poorer means of controlling um, the, the, the spread. And South Korea also doesn't have, I mean, China, you know, China can close down a city by clicking their fingers or close down all the trains. Uh, this is much, much harder in countries like South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine that uh, and another good measure also of control is what is the number of deaths per case. So, for example, in Germany, it's around 3%. It's, it's very, very low. Other places have much higher numbers. I think in Italy, it got to 18%. Now, obviously, if the cases were defined in the same way, we'd have exactly the same death rate per case because the disease is the same. But in some ways, you can measure the level of chaos by the fact that cases are being missed. So for example, in China, death rate was almost 5%, whereas outside Hubei, the death rate was less than 1%. So looking at these different countries, you could say that there is an independent measure of how well controlled they are. When the death rate is uh, uh, quite high, it basically means that we're not testing enough, we're not finding cases, yet the dynamics are similar. Right, so can I, can I um, um, have this uh, stressed out again? What you're saying is the differences in, um, in death rates in different places point primarily to the level of chaos at, uh, at a level of chaos which the places are in where those rates are being reported, is it? Well, basically, in order to find more cases, you have to do more testing. So if your hospital system is overwhelmed, dealing with very sick patients, you're not going to have a lot of extra capabilities to do testing. Right. Um, I think also it's not quite clear that the infection levels are probably much, much higher than the number of cases even found in places like Germany or Israel. So if you test more, you'll find more. Um, one other thing is, before I mentioned to you that there's this delay between new cases and new deaths. But in some places we saw very quickly that when there was a peak in new cases, that same day when they are very, very sick, or perhaps even no longer alive, and we can measure, you can, you can do a, a test for virus on a dead body. It's a, it doesn't require, it's not, it's not something that you need them to breathe or anything like that. So I think that what was happening in Italy, as well as in uh, Iran and other places as well, the, so these are the two things, the death rate and the interval between cases and deaths is a good measure of how much control we have. And we see this, uh, Korea is very well controlled, Austria was well controlled, Germany is well controlled. Some countries also don't really care. Because right. Some countries realize that we just want to get this over with. Right, and in this, in this context, this it might be of relevance what one of my previous uh, guests, um, Professor Knud Witkowski um, from New York has said that it was uh, not irrelevant that the German Robert Koch Institute did change the way of its reporting uh, in, the, in the halfway through this whole crisis. So previously there was a tradition of reporting the day um, of a diagnosis as well as, as the day of reporting. And if this had been carried through, that what you have just been describing would have been become evident afterwards with good time and look at the data that you would have seen, okay, this was reported then, but uh, it, it was diagnosed at a different day. Now this is not possible anymore. So therefore the reason why the German 
system may have been much more able to cope with uh, the with the epidemic um, is not so easily uh, analyzed anymore due this due to this change of, of reporting. Is that a fair assumption, or is it? I haven't, I haven't looked at the German numbers very carefully, I and mean, I look at them all the time. And I've just made a, I'm just presenting 131 countries, uh, all, all the graphs of. But the key thing is, is if you look at, uh, and there are many, many presentations like this. If you look at the graph on the same graph, which is what we always do, showing cases and deaths, then we found this in China. But in most places, there's a gap. In other words, cases go up, and then a week, two days, two weeks afterwards, there's the, the deaths go up. And that is a measure, if, if the deaths and the cases are superimposed, that's a measure, I think, of finding people at a very, very late stage. That is not happening in Germany because the fatality is not 15%, it's 3%. So I think, I, you know, I haven't studied the, this change in, in, in reporting. Um, I did find out that uh, in Sweden, very often the official reporting is a few days late, but there is a website that actually records the date of the death certificate. And then you get a better, a better idea for deaths. I, I, but I, overall, you know, there's been a lot of uh, fluctuation, a lot of noise in the way preventing analysis. I think uh, in Germany, you know, I, I think they did very, very well. Right. Um... Still in Germany, also um, to just discuss this, we didn't learn the number of tests. We only were told the number of cases. But from what you said just now, uh, the number of tests is relevant because from that you get an indication uh, of how the how fast the disease is spreading because if you make much more tests um, and find a lot of... You know, I, 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 what I really was saying is, is that the, the death rate, the number of deaths per case mm -hmm. depends on how much testing you're doing. So yeah. I, I, I can predict from the German uh, fatality ratio of around 3% how many tests were done for each case found. In Italy, the, the same uh, disease had a fatality rate of 15% or 18%. So in Italy, I'm sure they did very little testing other than people who were very sick. I mean, it depends who you test. If you, you know, in one case, I know that Germany tested a small city randomly. That's very mm -hmm. valuable. But you, don't, you can't do that if everyone is looking for testing. I, I actually think that uh, the testing not near is, is that we already suspect that even if you test a huge amount, you're still going to find people who are asymptomatic, who would test positive. Um, there will be dead people who die for other reasons who will test positive. So I think, uh, you know, I think it really depends what you're trying to do. And I think one problem with uh, the whole COVID epidemic worldwide is that different countries were trying to do different things. And I think this has, and some of these things were very important and other things were less important. So certain countries were trying to maximize the amount of testing they did. So each time they would publicize that for each case they found, they tested another hundred people. They were putting a lot of effort into that. Other countries were trying to minimize as much as they could their death rate basically by not in any way discounting the deaths of people who were either ill for very many other reasons or people who were very, very old and could well have died a natural death. I mean, many, I mean, you never really die a natural death. Most people die from something going wrong. I mean, it's like your car doesn't stop working naturally. One piece goes wrong. And uh, bronchial pneumonia, pneumonia is a very, very serious cause of death. Uh, and, you know, COVID in some ways leads to pneumonia. So I think that different countries do have different objectives. And that uh, right now it's still unclear whether your objective is to stop the outbreak as quickly as possible, or is your objective to get as many of your younger people immune as possible? And these are two very different objectives. And, you know, I'm not sure what the right one is.
All right. So um, could we could we um, change focus um, in our debate in our interview to the fact that early on in in China you just um, you just said that you detected that COVID wasn't really growing exponentially. Is this something which carries through through the um, uh, how the epidemic went worldwide, or is there a difference um, um, in the dynamics? So, as far as we can tell, it's the same. But what makes things complicated is where remember we're, we're getting information on a whole country. So let's imagine I'm looking at the numbers from Austria, and in Innsbruck there's one outbreak. And in another city, a few hundred kilometers away, there's a separate outbreak, which started three days after the outbreak in Innsbruck. Somebody from Innsbruck traveled to there, everyone got infected, there's another outbreak. Now we have two outbreaks growing, and we're adding the numbers together in the reporting. People are not saying these are the Innsbruck numbers. They know the same time, you can get different dynamics. Um, it's a little bit like if you have two rocket ships and what you give is the total height of both of them, you'll get a very, a very strange thing. Well, gee, this rocket is going twice the height, but in fact, it's going, each rocket is going the same height. So as we can, and South Korea was a, was a case where I very carefully analyzed the dynamics. And South Korea was interesting because South Korea was the first place where I noticed that there had been multiple outbreaks. South Korea had an outbreak that started very, very close to the time of the outbreaks in China at the end of January. But this outbreak only reached 30 people and was stopped. And then about three weeks later, they had another outbreak, a much bigger outbreak. And then a few days later, another big outbreak. So this indicates that the, each outbreak has a certain dynamic. But different outbreaks, if they're in different cities, don't interfere with each other. So the dynamic that we're seeing, this, this non-exponential growth, is basically saying that the, let's just think about this a little bit. Everyone talks about exponential growth. Let's see what it means. Let's imagine that I'm the only person infected in Germany. And I'm somebody, I'm a traveling salesman. So each day I come to a new place and each day I get to infect new people. And let's say I infect two people every two days. So initially I would have infected two people and these people will also be traveling salesmen and they also travel around. And very quickly you'll see that they will infect two each, each day. It will be one and then two and then four and then eight and so on. The number will just keep on doubling. That is exponential growth. And in that case, if I take the ratio of the number today divided by yesterday, it'll always be two. One, two, four, eight and so on. Now, mm -hmm. That is the ideal situation, and that is a very scary situation, because if you had a situation like that, then with doubling, you, you know, you'd very, very quickly uh, infect everybody. But real life isn't like that. So there's two things about real life. Normally, if you just, let's imagine that you infect somebody with corona when they talk to you. So most people in a day don't talk to completely random people. And one way to stop people talking to you, infecting you, is for them to have face covering because the procedure by which somebody who talks to you infects you is that when you talk, there's a very small micro spray of little droplets that contain the virus. Mm -hmm. So, and if I, if I wear a mask and you don't wear a mask and you're speaking to me, I will suck in your droplets, but you won't be able to spray them out. So you can see that, for example, a football game is a really bad place because people are shouting loudly. And often they look at each other when they shout because they want to say this. A, a noisy bar is a bad place because there's noise. A quiet bar would be fine. If you sit there quietly, there'd be no problem. So this is one of the things. So the thing is that it looked right from the beginning though. And this came up from the numbers. Basically what was happening is, is that the exponential growth, let's say each day you grow 20%. That's the exponential growth factor. The exponential growth factor was 20% on the first day, and then it was 17%, and then it was 15%. Literally, it was decreasing by, the growth factor was decreasing by 15% a day. And this ends up being a consequence of a certain equation for growth. 
but it is quite well known. It's called the Gompertz equation. It was actually uh, published by a British uh, epidemiologist or whatever in 1820 or 1826 or sometime like that. So it's more than 200 years old. And in this particular equation, it's basically for the growth of, say, bacteria when there is something limiting, maybe not enough food. Now, if you think about what does it mean for the growth of an epidemic? What, what you need to grow are to be surrounded by people who have never been exposed to the virus. And we don't know what is slowing down the growth. There could be several things. One possibility would be that, let's just say a coronavirus is, is, a, is, is the same virus as the common cold. Let's just imagine, and this is not necessarily true, that if you had a common cold the week before, you would be immune. This is not necessarily true, but if it was like that, and if there were many people who had common colds, if you're trying very hard to infect people, but some of them recently had a common cold and aren't gonna get infected because they have maybe antibodies or something like that, then you'll realize that you can't, you can't infect people. And if you can't infect, if you can't find your two people every day, you're not gonna be able to propagate exponentially. Now, there's another explanation, which is slightly more tricky. Uh, there are asymptomatic cases, people who uh, carry the virus, but have no symptoms. They're often they're young people who maybe are very physically fit. I, I mean, we've heard all sorts of stories about people who break their shoulder, go in to be x-rayed and to say, you have coronavirus, not from the, just by looking at their chest. So let's imagine that when I get infected, I am the first infected person in a certain town. But unbeknownst to me, three people in my circle, because we were all infected by the same person, are also infected, but they are silent cases. So I get sick, everyone are actually infecting people. And as a result, if I try to infect somebody, I can't, because they've already been infected. So I think, and you can see that this could have a huge effect because it would mean, first, that the number of people infected is much, much higher than the number of cases. But it also means, since these other people are near you, these people are, if you're a traveling salesman, there was a traveling salesman. That's like each person, each visible case is competing with the invisible cases for the same uninfected people. And this too will slow things down. In any case, the, the slowdown can, comes out of the numbers. Uh, I don't know with, you know, I wouldn't like to put a confidence level on, on, on believing it, but essentially the, this Gompertz curve that fit the data very well never actually has an exponential growth phase. Now, one trouble is, is that in England, the word exponential actually has two meanings. One is very fast, growing exponentially. But in fact, exponential mathematically means growing at the same rate. It's like getting compound interest from the bank you want 10% every year. You don't want 10% and then 9% and then 8% because very quickly you'll be getting nothing. So you want this to be a constant exponential growth. And the virus is not showing that. So these were some of the reasons why I, in my report of uh, 14th of March, already quite a long time ago, seven weeks ago, felt that this thing was growing quite slowly. It gave to say that the uh, growth is, is not as bad as it seems. So that was one thing that I discovered. Right. Um, so from, from this uh, findings, uh, you then um, just recently in an interview, which I saw, which you gave to British um, um, colleagues, you then said that the measures which have been taken to um, contain um, the epidemic have been too severe um, and are not justified by what the numbers tell about the severity of, um, of, of the epidemic. Well, I think that this is now a different story. So one thing that, uh, in the same way that when I first thought about the virus, I was very concerned about what is the fatality rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we really believe the case fatality rate coming out of Lombardia, would be almost 20%. It would be terribly frightening. But we know there that they just didn't have opportunity to measure cases. So a very important number to know is if you have situations where clearly the virus got out of hand in New York City, 
Lombardia, places in Spain. Uh, the very first place this happened was on that cruise ship Diamond Princess where 20% were infected. Uh, a ship is like a single hotel. It's very, very high density. So the question was, what percentage of the population die in places that are very heavily infected, like northern Italy, New York City, uh, parts of Spain, the Diamond Princess, Belgium. These are some of the cases where there's been. And what was interesting is that the number infected turns out to be on the order of 0.1%. The number of deaths per population. We no longer care about cases. We no longer care about infection. We just simply say that in this city of 1 million people, we had 1,000 deaths. That means it's one in a thousand who die. And that ends up being the number. Uh, it needs to be normalized by the age because this disease is very much hitting the old people. So if you had a city of 1 million people over 90, then you would get a higher death rate for that city. And if you had another city with 1 million people under 30, it would be a very different death rate, but you could account for these two. And the number you find is, is that the sort of average death rate for an average population density, average population distribution is around one-tenth of a percent. This was already clear from the Diamond Princess. It's one thing that I actually wrote about publicly on the 22nd of March in a website called The Medium. And basically there I said that one would, it looked to me- Again, uh, what, did, what did you write on, uh, on, on March 22nd or in, in the piece of Medium? Yeah, I wrote that saturation, the, the epidemic would stop when around one month, let's say in a, in a certain locality, we have 500 people die every month. That would be a relatively small city. Let's say that would be a city of 1 million people. 500 people die every month. I think it would be for that particular location to become saturated, 500 people, an extra 500 people would have to die for one month. So for one month, there would have to be double the death, or else for two months, there would have to be 50% extra death. Or over a year, there would just be 10% extra. But the thing is, is that we would have to have something like this number of deaths. The reason you do it this way is, is that uh, a city in Italy would have more deaths than a city, say, in Israel, even if the cities are of the same size, because Israel has a much lower natural death rate than Italy, because Italy has a much older population. So, and again, this would allow for this. Now, that, when I did that particular calculation, it was based solely on two locations. One was the Diamond Princess, and the other was the city of Wuhan, where there was uncertainty about how many had really died. I initially was using a number that was wrong. The number later increased by 50%. But even more so, we didn't know what the population of Wuhan had left. So, I have no idea what the census was, but the, they were both of the same order. And then you could apply those same numbers to other locations. So it looks to me that if a whole country gets saturated, every single area, not just, so for example, for Italy, not just Northern Italy, but all of Italy, you need to basically have an excess of deaths of about one month worth. And I think this is gonna be, be correct. I mean, you know, it might be six weeks, it might be three weeks, not that important. I mean, one clue we have about this is that in Europe, there's a, an organization called Euromomo, and they record the number of deaths from all their member countries um, every week. And they also have a, an idea of how many people should die in the first week of May. It's, it's, it's a number which, basically the first week of January, there are many more deaths than the first week of May because cold weather people die more easily. And then you can see how many extra deaths did you get. So far, uh, since about the uh, end of February, in the whole European area, it doesn't include all of Germany, but it includes, I think, Hesse and Berlin, uh, you're getting something like an extra 130,000 deaths. Now that sounds like a big number, but in that area, on a completely average week, about 53,000 people die. So, so far we have extra deaths of less than three weeks. And you, no one can say that Europe wasn't badly hit. I mean, Italy, France, 
Britain, Belgium, Holland, Sweden, all had Spain, all had very high death rates. So again, this seems that there is something that is not limiting the initial growth of the virus, but something that's, that's limiting the saturation. This could be herd immunity. It could be many things. I don't know what it is. My feeling is, is that it's probably herd immunity. Um, people, again, don't know what level of infection you need to get herd immunity. Some people have said it's 25%, others say 50%, others say 85%. We don't know. But we do know that all of these places are saturating at about the same level. Uh, and then I think is, so in some ways, you know, if you have a country like Sweden where things are just going freely, they will stop when they get to one month of, of natural death. Um, Germany may have stopped too soon um, because Germany, you know, we don't know about, I mean, China definitely stopped too soon. China ended up having less than one day of deaths for the whole country. Um, and uh, even though there were 5,000 5, deaths or something like that, but China is a very big country. Um, so I think that this is a different viewpoint that says not how we control the epidemic, but how we control the future. Um, trouble is, is that lockdown has a price. It has an economic price. It has a psychological price. It has a social price. And it's, it's not fair to say that our aim is to minimize death, where what we really need to do is minimize overall suffering. And, you know, there are many envisioned situations of lack of mobility, of children being at home, etc., which I think cause a, a great deal of additional suffering. So I think, and this is a little bit when it's important to distinguish here that epidemiologists generally see their job as stopping the epidemic. So for an epidemiologist to say, look, I know there's going to be one, everyone in Germany is going to die. You must listen to me. Stop everything, lock everybody up. It doesn't matter. Everyone else will die if you don't. And then, of course, you do it because you're so scared. And then anyway, they say, oh, well, because you did it, there'll only be 5,000 deaths. Now, what they should say is, is if you lock everybody up, there'll be no deaths. And clearly, if you could really keep everybody separated and have robots feeding them, you could get to that situation, except, of course, during that period, you would still have all the people who are naturally dying, dying. And I see this as a holistic picture of how do you minimize the suffering that a country is, is undergoing. And it requires dealing with all of these things. And in some ways, I think that uh, the one country that has really been very, very intelligent about this is Sweden. Um, they have basically practiced very limited lockdown. People are working, schools are open, and you know maybe people are not going to football games and meetings of more than 50 people aren't allowed, but restaurants are open, pubs are open. And you know I think that this seems to me to be something where they will reach their herd immunity. Norway, who practiced very tight lockdown, is now very proud of themselves. But if this virus comes back in November, what are they going to do? Lockdown again? Remember, the price for lockdown is very, very huge. And uh, so I think that what is needed is a, a very balanced approach. Uh, in, 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 in any situation, for example, let's just simply say that I found any death intolerable. So if we, if we stopped motor cars, we would have much less deaths. We stopped all activity. I mean, it's interesting if you look at Austria, who had practiced good lockdown, their number of deaths actually are much less than a normal week. In the last two weeks, Austria, I was saying that Austria has had a lower natural death rate for the last two weeks of April than ever before. Their deaths are lower by 10 standard deviations, which is way beyond what you would ever expect by fluctuations or chance. So they've saved lives. My guess is, is that when Austria comes to do the calculation of how many lives they lost and how many lives they saved, they may, may even have come out ahead. But saving, you know, there are other criteria. I mean, it would be wonderful if we could say that every life really matters, but every country 
does realize if, if, if I'm 100 years old and I want a heart transplant, no one's going to give me one. And therefore, these decisions are made. And I think, again, in Sweden, they took a very much more practical view of this. So, but um, in this interview, um, which I just mentioned, you, are, you, you, you still, you, you went on to, to draw a comparison or you drew, you, to draw a conclusion about, um, uh, well, the severity of what these, measure, uh, these measures um, have meant or will mean for future generations. Uh, these measures which are taken by, you said, the baby boomers, you considered yourself to be one. I am also a baby boomer. I'm also a baby boomer born in 1965. So this is something which, sorry? No, go ahead. This is something which, which uh, was uh, taken by people mainly from, from, from this um, generation or from this uh, um, population of baby boomers, um, but it will affect um, because it costs uh, economic growth, it costs uh, social um, distress and, and, and uh, all sorts of things which have also been well studied uh, in, in terms of effects uh, uh, of, of uh, what follows an economic uh, decline. So this is something which will add up um, to a much higher price in your view um, than, than what the um, the saving of lives or the, the controlling of, of the epidemic might have been worth in the first place? I think, it, it, you know, there's no doubt that the social, psychological, economic damage is considerable. I'm not a, a social economist, but I think they will discover, you know, I just, I look at young people who are saving to buy a house. Now, maybe, you know, I think that, that older people, um, are generally save, have living of savings. We're, we're not necessarily involved in a new startup business. We haven't just opened a, a store. We, we've basically done a lot of living. And I think it is much, much harder for the younger generation. But I think even beyond that, the baby boomers were a very lucky generation because we came after the, not just the second- Again, please, we came, after, we came after the second, not, not just before, after the second not just World War. The second World War but basically, the, the 1930s were, were a troubled period in much of the world, economically. So there was a long period in which the generation, to like our parents, had a hard time. And they were really happy to see us as the new generation and give us everything. And baby boomers had opportunities. We also had a period of peace. We've had peace now almost 75, or 75 years. And there've been little things, but nothing really major. And this is unusual. And I think that the baby boomers start to think that their music is best, their culture is best, etc. And obviously, the future is with the younger people. And, you know, I think that uh, I, 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 I have nothing against older people. I actually like, I, actually, I'm, I don't care really about age. I think it's what people do that matters. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not volunteering to you know, give up. Um, but the fact remains that the young people are our future. And, you know, besides the coronavirus, we have very high levels of pollution, very high levels of population, problems, oncoming problems with global warming. And, you know, we're not going to be dealing with those problems. I mean, you know, if I really wanted to, I could move to Sweden. I'm worried about global warming. I could move to anywhere. It seems to me that we need to, have, this should have been taken into account. I'm worried about a backlash. You know, I, I, I see lots of angry young people. And, you know, I sort of agree with them because uh, it's the ones who are entrepreneuring, the ones, you know, for an example is, is uh, in the area around Stanford. So Stanford is in Santa Clara County, which is a small, relatively small county. It's not the whole of California. They had about a hundred deaths, but they've been on lockdown now for six weeks. And they're planning an extra four weeks of lockdown. So basically, and now many of the people in this area, which includes Silicon Valley, are very happy to work from home. I mean, I've worked harder in the last six weeks than ever before in my life because I'm on the computer all the time. I don't mind lockdown. Actually, it's quite nice. My people in my group are saying, well, it's great because we don't have to take our children to lessons. Like lessons come to them, etc. 
But people who are working in restaurants, people who are doing cleaning, gardeners, builders, these people really have had a disastrous time. Now, it's much worse in the USA than it is in, in Europe because there's no social security. Um, in Israel as well, I mean, the independents are really upset. They're losing their livelihood. Uh, I know that in Europe, uh, people have been, uh, been given salaries, even if they're not working, and that I think is what should happen. But it doesn't happen in the USA. So I think that, you know, I mean, another thing about the USA that people need to realize, it's quite clear now that the profile from coronavirus is different in the USA than it is in Europe. Uh, in New York City, so in, in almost all the European countries, um, only 10% of fatalities are less than 70 years old. This is actually, normal flu is actually worse than this. In normal flu, the number who are less than 70 is a bigger number. In the USA, the number who are less than 70 is three times higher. It's 30%. So basically, we are losing a lot more young people. I think it's to do with the health system. I mean, many people there are not in very good health. I think it seems to me that coronavirus is killing people who are relatively close to death, whether it's because of some sickness, some being old. I mean, when you're old, you are closer to death. You know, it's, it's a natural way life works. Um, so I think this is actually quite a concern. And I think that when I was saying one month for Europe, one month of excess death, I would say for USA, it might be two months uh, because of some of these issues. So, uh, you know, and, and again, people are now getting very upset about this, but there's another interesting number. So in most of Europe, life expectancy is over 80 for men and women together. I know in Israel, it's uh, almost 83. In Portugal, it's high. I imagine in Germany, it's 81 or 82. In the United States, it's 78. The USA is losing three extra years of death all the time. People are dying earlier in the USA. And this is probably for economic reasons. Um, that is a much, much bigger problem. I mean, we could, we could easily, you know, so I think that there's a screenless exaggerated fixation on death because one of the very first things I did for myself was to ask how many people die in the world every day? And the answer is 150,000. So that's a big number, but if you look at it, this isn't such a huge number. And then I put this onto Twitter and somebody said, yes, but the problem is that 200,000 have been born every day. So we're still having population growth, which is probably not a good idea. But this means that from all causes, uh, you know, Germ what is the population of Germany, 80 million? 80 million, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this means that in Germany, around 1% of Germans are going to be dying every year. So that is 800,000. So that means that every day we have 3,000, I'm, I'm doing the numbers, my two, two and a half thousand or something two, like two, that. Two and a half thousand per day, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is always, so these numbers are there. And, you know, I think if the television wanted to have programs all day about who has died and how sad it is and so on, we could do that. It wouldn't be very helpful because it is sad. When somebody dies, it's, it's very sad because you lose, the feet are gone, it's, it's terrible. But we've been living like this for a long time. The other comparison is with seasonal flu. And I was saying that in Europe, uh, so far, COVID has led to about 130,000 excess deaths. Well, in 2018, there were 110,000 excess deaths from flu. We didn't stop the economy. Most people even have no idea that it was a bad flu. People were dying in the same numbers. So I think, you know, one thing that scientists try to do is get some kind of uh, proportionality, some kind of background. So if somebody says, oh, people are dying, and then you would have to say, well, people always die. Or people who are dying are old. Well, old people always die. And this is very important. Right. Um, I mustn't take up your time for too long, but there is one question I would like to, 
to ask, um, and this relates to um, the widespread um, sentiment and opinion in Germany that it's good to have a precautionary uh, principle um, applied to policy decision making and therefore uh, that it is possible that this is a very, very um, severe virus. Um, also, even for the people or even for, for those who might have, uh, uh, what's the English, uh, who, might, who might get uh, sick in the future. So, so therefore we need to um, uh, do the containment and we need to wait for a um, vaccination to stop uh, the, the spread of the virus. The problem I have with this is that if this were true, we were given the wrong explanation at the start of this, which was just flattening the curve to uh, prevent hospitals from overwhelming. So therefore, it's also a thing of credibility. But notwithstanding this, is it, is it um, likely or is it, is it fair to say that, yes, we, uh, we ought to uh, really pr um, prepare for a, a considerable time of, um, of lockdown to to wait for for a vaccination uh, to be safe for the future for our kids. Well, I think firstly we don't know when a vaccination is coming, and we've never actually had any vaccinations against coronaviruses. Uh, people have tried because the common co I mean, like a vaccination against the common cold would sell very well and would save lots of money. I mean, we lose a lot of days of work due to the common cold. People don't die. Um, the other thing is that all the evidence we've seen so far is that the death rates, even in places that have been badly controlled, like Italy or New York City, have not been super high. I mean, essentially, um, the death rates have been around one in a thousand. But in Italy, you know, one thousand in Italy would be 60,000 people. Right now, we're at 30,000. But of course, not all of Italy has been very badly hit. In places like Lombardy, we are getting to one in a thousand. So one in a thousand is exactly the same risk that people over 65 have from flu. Now, people over, six, over 65 or 70 have a higher risk from coronavirus, but it's still, for the whole population, you know, a smaller risk, flu, certainly in the USA, and I haven't studied flu enough in Europe, it may have a different profile, but flu kills young people. Flu kills five-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 30-year-olds. Um, in, I was telling you before about these excess deaths as recorded by Euromomo. So they give the numbers for people, all people, and I said there were 130,000 all people, and then you can ask, well, looking at the numbers, how many of those people were under 65? And the answer is, less than 10%. So the actual burden of death for younger people may well have been less than during flu epidemics. I can check this myself and I haven't actually done so yet. It can certainly be checked. So this is one of the things that make, makes one think, you know, this is not true. I mean, you can, you can believe, I mean, all the evidence is that firstly that the disease does seem to stop. Secondly, that it's not so in again, some ways, say again. It's Secondly, damaging to an age group who are at high risk. It's not damaging, you know. If, if if let's just imagine that coronavirus had exactly the same death rate, but everyone was below thirty, that would be the most terrible thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, one way that people measure the burden of death is to look at the age of the person who dies, and if he dies over the life expectancy we don't count anything. And let's say my life expectancy is 82 and I die at the age of 80, that counts as two years. Whereas if somebody dies at the age of 10 years old, that counts as 72 years. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, I mean, that's a fair way to do it. It seems to me that's what economists do. That's, insurance companies do this all the time. If I wanted to get life insurance now, nobody would give me life insurance. So why, you know, if, if they want to insure my life, you know, isn't that, isn't that as a big risk? So I think that these are all the things that have to be taken to in, into account. Um, I don't see any, any basis for this. I also think that very, very soon, so yesterday I noticed, 
I, I do a lot of computing all the time. And yesterday I found a, a better way to smooth the numbers because the numbers in Sweden depend very much on the day of the week. There's very big numbers on Friday and very small numbers on Sunday. So you see this zigzag curve. But if you smooth the numbers, you find that Sweden actually has passed the maximum of deaths. The number of new deaths in Sweden has passed its maximum. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see this, but if you look at the numbers carefully, you can see it. And then on Twitter, somebody told me that instead of looking at the day reported, look at the death certificate date. And then you very clearly see this phenomenon. But I, I didn't want to go there because we can't do the same thing for everywhere. So even Sweden, which has had a very liberal policy, has done fine. Um, you know, so looking at all of this, it makes me feel um, that, you know, what these people are arguing doesn't make sense. There's one final thing. Uh, in Europe, in most years, between December and middle of February, there are a lot of extra deaths from influenza. There was a big peak in 2018, a smaller peak in 2019. This last winter, there was no influenza deaths in Europe. Now, if you think what that means, it means there are a lot of people who very sadly would have died from influenza, because, but they weren't any. Those people are now dying, or maybe not the same, but that same group of people are now dying from corona. So in some ways, this is not, you know, I think even if in Europe we have 200,000 uh, deaths, it may be worse than 2018, is very much an oscillating thing. So I see no basis for this at all. I think uh, the, the, you know, I think we need to know who is saying this. People who are being paid anyway, people who are retired, people who are living off savings are much, much, much less vulnerable to the problems of shutdown. Uh, you know, maybe somebody working at BMW or Mercedes, you know, I don't know how long they're going to get paid their salary for. I mean, the country at some point can't keep on doing this. Um, so I think that there's no basis for this. And I th but I think, you know, my feeling is, is that in the same way that panic developed very quickly, you will see that in one week's time, this will no longer be an issue. People will forget about it. And, uh, you know, the, 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 free, the unfreezing of the lockdown will happen much more quickly than people anticipate. Wow, that's a very, very optimistic and very nice uh, um, thought to, to close this interview uh, with, uh, because it is something that uh, I, I think would be tremendous. Uh, thank you very much. Um, A pleasure, Mike. Michael, it has been a, a huge pleasure talking to you and getting your insight um, into the understanding of what numbers um, are able to, to tell if one understands how to look at them. Um, so all the best to you and uh, Very much. you take care. You take care too. Bye-bye for now. Bye.